I released an early beta version of the Napster software during the summer and it spread quickly by word of mouth. It hasn't stopped growing since. Napster users can download musical selections in an MP3 format. MP3 is what's called a variable loss compression algorithm. Here's how it works. <laughs> Napster and downloadable distribution is the biggest excitement since disco rap in the Beatles. It's like new radio. The majority of usage of the MP3 format um, is for unauthorized sound recordings. Yeah, I would like a CD player, but I can't spend $16 on a CD. Napster is an evil, 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 evil place to go. Tony Rusinato is standing by live in San Mateo with more details on this story. This last fall semester wore on, hundreds quickly turned to millions, with the program spreading across college campuses like wildfire. I have never seen the industry under siege like this in the 30 years I've been in this business. It's very important that the internet go the legitimate route instead of becoming a haven for pirates. So you don't think this is stealing? Not at all, because you're just getting a few songs that you find interesting. The N-word, you know, appeared, and we had to defend ourselves. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, Napster has changed everything, and the record companies are sadly behind the curve. At its peak, nearly 60 million people used the site to swap music files from each other's computers for free. The whole internet could be re-architected by Napster-like technology. Napster is the tip of the iceberg. I think you're, you're talking about the proverbial finger in the dike. Fuck Napster. 30 years ago, the San Francisco Symphony released its music on LPs. Then came cassettes. And now, of course, CDs. But in the very near future, you may be able to download their music from the internet. We met over the internet, and we knew each other for like three or four years or something before we ever met in person. Mm -hmm. We met the first time as a result of Napster. Sean flew down from Boston to Virginia to meet with some investors that I'd set up a meeting with. The doorbell rang. I was nervous for a brief second, kind of like going on a, like a first date uh, with someone you're starting a company with. And, uh, and the door opened, it was fanning, he looked at me, he said, you look exactly like I thought you'd look. And I said, you look exactly like I thought you'd look. And he said, okay, great, let's go over the presentation. So we jumped into the PowerPoint and went through all the slides and then got in my parents' minivan and, and my dad drove us to our first investor pitch. I take issue with people who say, ah, the moment I saw it, I knew it was gonna be fucking huge and take over the universe. They're all lying. There's no possible way. No one had that conceptualization in the beginning. I don't even believe Fanning did. You're saying that people are going to download a client, put a client on their computers, and they're going to allow stuff on their hard drive to be shared. Most of the development of the web up until Napster was basically about information storage and information retrieval. It wasn't about connecting people to people. We're gonna like download stuff from each other. Like, I was like, nobody's gonna open up their hard drive like that. Nobody's gonna allow their bandwidth to be used. This sort of comes onto my radar and it's really interesting. No one is going to share an MP3. That, that was my quote, no one's gonna share an MP3. And boy, was I wrong. I was so wrong. Our system has been built, this time-sharing system, for about six months now. It's been working. And in that time, we've gone from getting one console to getting about six working now, with six more due the rest of the spring. What, what is Internet that, anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now.
<laughs> what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought uh, you were going to tell us what this was. It's so like a look computer, computer billboard. It's, it's not a. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Just right. I wrote a piece back in 1990 that that it would shortly be the case that that everybody under 20 at that point would become native to a place where everybody over 20 at that point would always be an immigrant. So I was a, a young teenager, and I, I was running a, uh, running a BBS, which was um, somewhat sophomorically titled Realm of Darkness. But online in the BBS era met connected to potentially one, maybe a hundred other people, maximum. And that, that's what was so profoundly different about the explosion of the internet, was that it was one network. So suddenly you could be connected to everyone. There are now a very large number of people that are online that are young. And, you know, they have a completely different sense of how the world works and what power is and what, what authority ought to be. I mean, it's a profound shift. It's the difference between vertical authority, you know, God-given, physically enforceable authority and horizontal authority. I have joked in the past that Fanny and I were like, well, where did you, where did you guys meet? And we're, we were part of the, you know, Fanny and I were part of the same underground network of elite cyber criminals. <laughs> and it, it's basically true. We met through IRC. Um, as we both got drawn into IRC, we became more and more addicted to it and more and more fascinated by it, which made us fight much harder to retain access to it. And then, you know, over time, it became our lives. It took over our lives. You're talking about revolutionizing the way we use computers and how we use the internet. Oh, absolutely. Revolutionizing. No, absolutely. I mean, it, this, is, this system, what's, what's most interesting about it is you're interacting with peers. You're exchanging information with, you know, the person down the street. And we're just beginning. Oh, absolutely. Sean Fanning's one of the smartest people I've ever met. He was teaching himself how to program, and he saw this really simple way to find music that he could listen to on the internet. Here was a guy with no clout, no connections, 19 years old, and he really changed the way we think about the internet. Uh, it's hard to explain where things were at back then. I mean, I was 18. I didn't really, I hadn't really seen much of the world. You know, I didn't really, um, I, I think it was, I mean, the best way to say it is it kind of came from a very pure place. I was excited because he was my first, so, I thought, I mean, you know, I really did think he was going to conquer the world. Everybody does with their first kid, right? You know, I was born in Brockton and uh, didn't have the most stable family. Um, you know, they made their best effort, but I grew up with a stepdad, and we ended up in foster care a couple times. Brockton was just, uh, no, Brockton was just no good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much about like money situation, but like, you know, we, we grew up like not too well off, you know, and my mom and dad, there's five kids and my dad was a delivery driver, you know, and they did the best they could, but then we moved down to the Cape. That's when he got into sports, we moved down to the Cape. Being in the sports, I think it got his mind off of other things um, so that life was a little easier for him. I think music helped him too, like sports. Every time he was on the computer, he had the radio there. And you know what I mean? Like he was always listening to music. So, um, there's really no surprise there that he he ended up in you know thinking of something that made sense to him as far as um, the music and the computer combined. I was fortunate to have an uncle who was into technology and gave me my first computer. There's a, there's a lot of insecurity that comes around being um, dependent on others, you know, to get by. And so, as a kid, it sort of influenced my social uh, confidence at school. We moved around a lot. Um, there was also kind of a, I didn't feel as connected to my family intellectually, and so, um, I didn't really have many others at school either in that front, so it was sort of feeling a little bit, uh, lost and then displaced at times. Going online and finding people who had the same interests or I could learn from and where there was no, your reputation was your own. It was not about, like, you know, the, how well off your family was or how well you dressed. Um, or how well you spoke, or body language. It was about the merit of what you were saying, and I think that, for me, was just intoxicating. 
In the early days of the web, you know, the first time I ever saw music that was downloadable was a song that I put up on my homepage on the campus internet. It was an MP2 file. I guess that would have been 93, around, around that time. And there are very few people out there who could play it because you either change it into another file format or have a special card to play it. For anyone who had been downloading stuff from the internet, it was such a colossal pain in the ass. It's not fun. Uh, even for technical people, it was a, a process and, and a constant, like, trying to get bits and pieces of files and reconnect them all together, and that was kind of a pain in the ass. You know, 1998, was when it really felt like, okay, this is real. This is the way I'm going to listen to music. It became clear that the computer was going to be the place that we would store our music. Then you started looking for tools to get the music into the computer, tools to play it back, tools to manage it. I remember the first MP3 I ever downloaded, and I remember the first time I ever, you know, basically ever played a track from the internet. And I remember just thinking, even though it's just information, it's just audio, there's such a crazy amount of emotion. The fact that you could kind of share emotion over the internet, it was, so, it was really wild to think that something so important to you, you could just trade so freely. So I think it was, um, you know, it's, it's hard to quantify how important it was. I was a freshman at Northeastern University in Boston. One of my roommates was into MP3s. And he would skip class and sit home and download music. And he was always complaining about how unreliable the technology was. And what, so, was his, what were his favorite bands, do you remember? I don't know. He listened to a lot of really weird stuff. I, I had very incompatible tastes with him. but um, <laughs> Like every roommate in college. Yeah, which it, it, that's why it was a struggle. I didn't want to make it any easier for him to find that music. <laughs> but no, I mean, he, you know, he was complaining a lot. And that sort of signaled me that there was a potential uh, there's a problem that could be solved, and I just looked into it and um, came up with the solution, which ultimately became Napster. It felt like, you know, this way of sharing media between people could be used for sharing anything. We started with music, but it made sense that it could work for anything else. It also felt like this whole model for sharing media was superior to, like, going and buying an album. Uh, being able to uh, both um, buy tracks as singles or share them with your friends and find stuff your friends like, uh, and then being able to, um, you know, basically to have access to the entire universe of recorded music where independent creators could publish directly. It just seemed from every, in every way, it seemed like a better system. So I would spend the weekend working on it at my uncle's office. You know, every time I had to go back to school, I'd kind of drag myself back. Two days would become three days. I'd miss a day of classes. I'd miss two days of classes. It was just becoming more and more difficult for me to get myself back to school with any enthusiasm. My cousin was actually driving me back to school, and when I got there, I thought about it and finally realized just what a sense of relief I had when I thought about the idea of just, just leaving. And that was the last time I really ever came close to the campus, didn't pick up any of my stuff, didn't tell my, my roommates, just, just went back, and uh, I remember just feeling so excited. He came in, and he was just like, I need to talk to you guys, it's really important. I'm like, okay, Sean. And so he came in and um, he says, um, you're not going to be happy about this. And, and he was looking at me and I'm like, what? And he's like, I'm going to drop out of school. And I said, oh, no. Why would you do that? And he said, you don't understand. I, I have this idea. I have to go with it now. I have to do it now. It's now or never. I feel like this is the time for me to do it. And I don't think you'll be disappointed.